Well, good morning and welcome to our morning prayer service on this, the 12th Sunday after Trinity. It's focused this time on St. Issue's Church in Patricio. And it's a special day because our priest, Reverend Chris Bowler, is retiring and will deliver his final ministry area sermon today. Chris has been with us here in the Vale of Grainy for over six years, and we thank him for all he's done here, not only in our churches, but also for his work in Lamberda Church Primary School. We're very sorry indeed to lose him, and we ask God's blessing for now and the future on him and his wife Wendy. We have help today from across the Vale of Griney. Rob and Rafferty York from Patricio are both reading. From Slangeny we have Logan Townsend for the New Testament lesson and intercession prayers led by Malcolm Thomas. Musical support plus our hymns are played and sung by the Cook family from Slambeda. I'm really grateful to all of them. And as Annabelle reminded us last week, we owe a great deal to the skill, dedication and enterprise of James, Simon and any others who've been putting these services together, no doubt often having to field last minute changes and doing it with such good grace. Thank you to all. Now, I'm not only leading this service today, but have also been asked to talk about the Ministry of Bell, so I fear you've got me for the next part of the proceedings as well. So let's get on with it. Well, I just wish we had bells like that and the skills to ring them as well as that. Those clips showed ringers at Westminster Abbey and they were performing a principle called Stedman Caters. You also had a bird's eye view in the belfry looking down on the set of 10 in full circle action. I hope some initial technical and historical background will be of interest. Church bells can be used in any or even in all of three basic ways, depending upon their installation. Firstly, they can be sounded by being swung through incomplete arcs against their internal clappers, known as swing chiming. Patricio's bells that you heard right at the beginning are done that way, as are others in our ministry area, at Langeni, for instance. Secondly, when temporarily or permanently immobilised on their mountings, bells can be sounded via ropes connected to hammers or even direct to the clappers. Crick Howell's bells are sounded like that, and we have a related additional mechanism at Flambeda that can achieve the same thing, known as an elecum apparatus. And then finally, in a complex extension of that first swing chime idea, as we saw in the Westminster Abbey setup, with clappered bells wheel mounted and swung through a full 360 degrees in each direction, a louder sound and control of the striking speed become possible. Bells in four St. Catug towers are set up in this fashion, Thlangatuk, Thlanethli, Cumdi, and Thlambeda. Some frantic history now. Small pottery clappered handbells from China have been dated back as far as the 3rd millennium BC. As Bronze Ages advanced at different stages in various parts of the world, bells were cast in this alloy and served an increasing range of uses, both practical and devotional, their designs often strongly expressing cultural identity. Because of its relevance to Confucian ideals, Neil McGregor picked a highly decorated 5th century BC unclappered Chinese bronze bell as the 30th artefact in his History of the World in a Hundred Objects. Small bells in gold sewn into the high priest's robe are mentioned more than once in the book of Exodus. In Western Britain, during the early Middle Ages, Quadrangular handbells used by Celtic Christian missionaries for calling to prayer were typically made from hammered iron sheets, overlapped, riveted, and then often dipped in bronze. We can say this one, now in the National Museum of Wales, 
is ours. It's St. Kenai's bell, discovered over 200 years ago in Llangeni, and it may even date as far back as the early 9th century. Larger bronze bells are likely to have been first introduced as permanent fixtures in Christian places of worship in Italy during the early 6th century AD, and we know from the writings of the Venerable Bede that they were already present in some British monasteries by the late 7th century. In the early 17th century, bells were added to churches more often and in greater numbers, and newer techniques for hanging them developed, with the arcs through which they could swing getting larger and larger. By the mid-17th century, it was pretty standard bell hanging practice to mount them on full wheels, as described earlier, permitting speeds to be controlled by ringers rather than determined almost entirely by pendulum mechanics. With the addition of the stay and slider mechanism, even heavy bells, when properly counterweighted, could be rung up and set ready for action in the upside down position. And these innovations underpinned development of the English change ringing style that concentrates on mathematical patterning rather than on tunes. A substantial secular interest in the art emerged. Bells were in churches, but the physical and mental challenges attracted the less devout as well as the religiously observant. Reforms in the late 19th century gained clerical control of many belfries that had by then become rather unruly, but I'm glad to say that the relationship these days is usually excellent. It has to be said that many who enthusiastically support church services where they're ringing are not themselves regular congregation members. We have some significant bells in our ministry area. For example, the six at Cum D, a complete and original set from a Chepstow founder in 1719, were hung untuned just as cast. Uh, this is what's known as a maiden ring, which is unusual anyway and unique in our whole diocese. Five of the eight bells now at Slangatic are from that same founder and year. Of the wheel hung bells in the MA, our oldest is the largest one of those at Lenethley, cast in Bristol around 1450. Just think about that. That's around the time Constantinople fell to the Ottomans. But a couple of our little swing chime bells are older still. For instance, the smaller of Patricio's two could well date from some point during the 14th century, and one of the two currently unringable bells at Tritawa is probably from around 1300, much, much older than the church building it's in, and an approximate contemporary of Tritawa Court's first construction phase, when the castle was still in use. So these are treasures indeed. But can church bells offer useful mission in the third millennium AD? How can their sounds be relevant to modern concerns? A surprising mixture of ages and backgrounds come together amongst those who use them. As you've heard, ringers include atheists, and there are some from other faiths too. Yet whatever their beliefs, They'll gladly support Sunday services, not only at their own local churches, but often elsewhere as well. In normal times, it's an excellent focus for some cross-boundary camaraderie. The range of interests attracting these people includes history, method mathematics and composition, the pursuit of excellent striking, which by the way is jolly demanding, and there are several highly accomplished musician bell ringers in nearby ministry areas, and some are absorbed by interest in the engineering aspects. We have a couple of young full circle ringers attending Lambeda practices and Kerry Andrews has long recruited young people to help chime the Crick Howell bells. The exercise therefore involves people in the life of the church who might otherwise never engage with it. But more, bells make our church buildings speak out the voice they give doesn't have to be restricted to calling for services, important though that is. A church can use them to underline its general community focus and do so publicly beyond its own walls, provided the locals know why. And things don't always have to be announced on colossal notice boards either. 
Of course, bells are heard at weddings, but they can also mark important birthdays or big personal anniversaries. They can ring solemnly to honour the dead or perhaps more joyfully to celebrate past lives well lived. They can support events and commemorations, both local and national, which is especially important if other public ways of marking them are limited. This is an example from a quarter peal rung a couple of years ago on half-muffled bells in Lambeda to help honour 10 American airmen on the 75th anniversary of their deaths in a flying fortress crash nearby. The method was first composed in the mid-17th century, and the recording here was made by a relative of a crew member who had come over from Sweden for the occasion. After the coronavirus lockdown began, little happened in churches until only a few weeks ago. They'd been closed. In some cases, though, bells were still able to help them shout against the silence and show the buildings were actually alive and still relevant to local communities and their concerns. For instance, bells joined their neighbouring populations in some towns and villages when NHS and frontline workers were applauded on Thursdays. Flambeda and Krakowl both managed to keep this going in our MA. And in the same period, bells commemorated those who died two years earlier in the Grenfell Tower fire, marked the 72nd NHS anniversary, and, most recently, the 75th anniversary of VJ Day. Five weeks ago, on my way in to use Elecum chimes before our first Sunday service in Slambeda for many months, I met a lady from the Worcester area waiting on a bench in the churchyard for her walking companions to arrive. My wife came just after the bells had stopped, and the lady told her that their sound had been for her the nicest thing she'd heard since the beginning of lockdown. Simply knowing they can lift the spirit like that is good enough for me. O oh God, who has given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to show your praise, help us to worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with understanding, with reverence, and with joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and also with you. Our first hymn this morning, with string accompaniment, is Come Ye Faithful, Raise the Strain.
From Psalm 105 O give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgment he has uttered, O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Then Israel came to Egypt. Jacob lived as an alien in the land of Ham. And the Lord made his people very fruitful, and made them stronger than their foes, whose hearts he then turned to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. He sent his servant Moses and Aaron, whom he had chosen. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Amen. We'll take a few moments to think of ways in which we may have let down ourselves, other people, and God, whether it's something just in the last week, or even something from much further back that's been troubling us, that we've allowed to go unresolved. And so we say, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Forgive others. Forgive yourselves. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins. Heal and strengthen you by his Spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Let everything be said and done in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God through Jesus Christ. Sing psalms, hymns and sacred songs. Let us sing to God with thankful hearts. Open our lips, Lord, and we shall praise your name. And now we're going to exchange the peace it's a point in our recorded services where we obviously struggle to reproduce, or perhaps one might say mimic, what we do when we're physically gathered together. Each church has its own approach to it in normal circumstances. Our present situation gives us an opportunity to reflect and remind ourselves that the peace isn't merely a matter of exchanging perfunctory hand waves, and it's more than just a relaxing moment of informality in the service. It's an announcement of the grace received through the word, which we then pass on to each other. And not just at this moment each week either. A ministry in which we can all take part. And so, the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Now we'll hear today's Bible readings 
first from the Old Testament by Rob York, then the Epistle read by Logan Townsend, and Rafferty York will deliver today's Gospel reading. A reading from Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was, he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezurites and the Hittivites and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I had come, if I come to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent to me, to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from St Paul's letter to the Romans. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honour. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all beloved never avenge yourselves but leave room for the wrath of god for it is written vengeance is mine i will repay says the lord no if your enemies are hungry feed them if they are thirsty give them something to drink for by doing this you will heap burning coals on their heads do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Listen to the Gospel of Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples 
that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind, not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of the, his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In his letter to the Romans, St. Paul gives us a formidable task list. Can we possibly hope to do all these things? Well, perhaps with a good supply of faith, hope and love, and importantly, the grace of God. St. Paul calls us to love in a new and unexpected way too. So how do we respond to those who are against us, even hate us? Well, by loving them more. When people are attacking you, responding by loving them is unexpected. But we follow Jesus, who did the unexpected, who turned the values of the world upside down and taught us to love those who wouldn't love us, to be good people. This reading pivots things the opposite way to how we would expect. If someone is your enemy and they are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them a drink. If someone is evil towards you, don't return evil, but show them love. Well, this can seem counter to our secular culture. Jesus warns about this human perspective in the gospel. Many people who have a bit of power or influence seem to seek further advantage, maybe get one over on another person. Some politicians are always looking to discredit others, even in their own party, to promote themselves. Powerful nations dip into conflicts to further their own interests, rather than the opportunity of solving problems and bringing peace. Vaccines are in danger of being hoarded for use first by their own countries. We can despair about what looks like wrong behaviour, but do we show the same shortcomings? I think most of us have learned how to be polite to others, how to speak kindly, avoid hurting their feelings and appear to take an interest in them. We may even be adept in pretending to show compassion when we hear of others' needs, or to become outraged when we learn of injustice. But God calls us to a real and genuine love, that's more than being sympathetic and polite, to show love instinctively, well, genuine love takes commitment. It means encouraging others to be better people. It takes time. Individually, it is unrealistic to do all this in our communities. But as a gathered church in the power of Christ, it becomes possible. This means we need to look for the people who need our love and show love in action building a community for Christ. 
Another way we are called to be different is to never consider other people as somehow inferior. We need to live in harmony with others and not be too proud to enjoy the company of people we think of as maybe less than us. Are we willing to live in harmony to help and befriend newcomers? Or do we relate only to those who think like us, who will get ahead or do something for us? We fall short of our calling when we don't live up to the expectations that we heard about in the letter to the Romans. They are tough expectations, but remember St. Paul wrote that he is not perfect. With God he had courage. Without God life was harder. I have experienced many times the heartbreaking pain of people in broken relationships, unwilling or unable to forgive. I've also seen the joy in reconciliations that once seemed impossible. St Paul calls us to forgiveness, even if people have deeply hurt us. Forgiveness is love in action, and forgiveness in action leads to reconciliation. Forgiving someone can release us from a burden of bitterness and resentment. Forgiving also involves action. If you'd find it too hard to forgive someone who's hurt you, maybe respond with kind actions. Try to tell the person you would like to rebuild your relationship. Offer help or give them a small gift. And sometimes our right actions will bear fruit. If we show love in the same way that Jesus loves us, we will be willing to forgive. What St Paul tells us to do is maybe unexpected and may make us fear failure. In the Gospel, what Peter heard from Jesus was unexpected. Jesus was facing up to his very human fears and letting Peter know this. He was also preparing Peter to face up to his fear and also the true purpose and the reality of the cost of this mission of salvation and that his followers have to share it. Jesus said, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Maybe an interesting exercise would be to have a few quiet moments reading through St Paul's list and looking honestly at how well we match up to these rather tough expectations and then think about the reward we are expecting. Let us now join and affirm our faith in the words of the baptismal creed. I believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist. I believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again. I believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world. This is the faith of the Church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so now we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And Malcolm Thomas will now lead our intercessions. Let us pray to the Lord, to the God who is our shelter and strength, always ready to help us in times of trouble. We pray for the church and for our fellow members in the body of Christ throughout the world. Assist the clergy and lay members to reach out to our wider communities of faith and no faith and offer them the reassurance and solace that could be found in your loving kindness. Today we remember in our prayers the Reverend Chris Bowler, who is retiring from his role in the Vale of Groney parishes and the wider ministry area. We thank you, Lord, for calling Chris to his vocation and guiding and sustaining him during his time with us. His faith and humanity have made him a worthy channel of your peace. We pray that Chris and his wife Wendy will be granted a long and fulfilling time in this new chapter of their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in education. As children in Wales prepare to return to school this week, we ask you, Lord, to help all pupils and staff to adjust to this change after such a long period of disruption. Keep them safe while ensuring that children can once again experience the joy of learning and social interaction. For some young people, the process of assessment has been particularly stressful this year. Give strength and wisdom to their families, teachers and mentors so that they're enabled to offer sound advice, guidance and comfort to all those affected and so that they can be helped through this difficult period in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for world leaders and their governments, for areas currently besieged by the pandemic. We think particularly of countries where health care and resources are scarce, and the virus is likely to bring even further suffering. Show mercy, Lord, to all those whose health and well-being is being ne negatively impacted upon by this global crisis. Through your loving kindness, provide them with comfort and hope for a more positive future. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who have lost loved ones at this time or are yet to suffer such loss. O oh Lord, offer them the consolation of your love and for those who have died in the hope of the resurrection, may they have rest in that place where there is no more pain or grief but life eternal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we beseech you to receive our prayers and hear the voice of our supplications as we, who trust in your word, eagerly await your help. For you are the God of our salvation. This we ask through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us say the Collect for the Twelfth Sunday after Trinity together. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Our final hymn is Praise to the Holiest in the Heights. Pray for safety, may the sky be our protecting veil, the sun a kindly light, the hills be our friend, the rains touch us lightly, and the Holy Spirit be our guide and our strength. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. 
and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and evermore. Amen.